Yeah, I just, I'd stop this because um, I think I want not get sick today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so welcome you um, to my favorite topic. It's microservices. Um, oh no, <laughs> maybe she will listen here. <laughs> um, is I microservice is a is a topic which is um, very very upcoming now. It's you see it on many conferences and even in, in some. Um, uh, no, <laughs> who can take this one? <laughs> and oh, it has a battery, so we can. Ah, too much live in it. So microservices is a is a topic um, which is um, evolving over the last last yeah, year maybe and becoming more and more visibility. Um, there's no clear definition what microservices are. So what I'm what I'm showing you are, are a bit of opinions of other people, but also a lot of my opinions in it. So don't take this as microservice, but um, get my picture with this. Um, to start talking about microservices, has to start by talking and explaining a monolithic software architecture. So, um, what's bad on monolithic software? I, I often have seen very large systems where, where all the software is, is yeah, working together and you have one big deployment and um, after time, it is very hard to, to work with this. This is, um, I think, the, one of the biggest problems currently in, in maintenance and in re reuse of um, software modules. Um, what's hard with a monolith? It's hard to test it. So um, you can't isolate pieces, isolate pieces to test them. Um, it's hard to refactor because you always um, kick something other down if you if you change pieces, um, because you cannot um, see the the, the um, changes to the system if you if you do something with it. Especially when you come to bigger teams or small teams um, but a few of them in bigger environments and you don't have you have um, shared code so you don't have a code ownership then it's um, very hard to work together on a monolith um, and um, a lot of software uh, um, software knowledge is about reusability and we, we often see reusage on technical parts. So it's easy to um, reuse a transport library or a network stack or REST or JSON library, things like that. But it's very hard to reuse functionality in software. It's not often that I, that I saw the reusage of fun functional components. So um, this is especially, I think, because in a monolith, the, the Things are very tied together. So if you try to take functionality out of the monolith and put it in another context, then you lose too much context information or tongue or dependencies, and so it's hard to, to reuse functionality. And um, especially in runtime, it's very hard with a monolith because you have the, the same runtime dependencies for, for the complete system. So uh, on performance and scaling, you always have to scale up the the whole of the system and um, you always have to deploy the complete system at, at all and with big systems this becomes um, very very hard nearly impossible in some, some things so in, in big enterprises you often see the problem that the product at the start is very fast and then uh, at the end you only are able to do one release a year or one release <laughs> or two years or things like that because it's not possible to to bring the monolith software in a in a consolid state um, more often. Um, I think this was the, the last talk on a slide. I have 25 slides, so I will speed up a bit. I, maybe it's a bit too much content. If I'm getting too fast, then please raise, raise up your hands, tell some questions, and we can even, um, yeah, if not follow the, the presentation on this part and, and talk about it. So I'm not 
not fixed to do it in a, in a fast way. Um, but how to avoid a monolith? It's not easy to say what makes software monolithic. Um, because it's nothing about technology. So even if I, if I show you a nice Microsoft framework and you are doing everything right from a technical point of view, you may end up with something distributed and everything's talking with rest to each other, but um, in the end you end up maybe with, with the same thing than before, but with, with additional hazard on, on distribution. So um, the first part of my talk is about how to design the architecture to get a, a, vertical, a vertical architecture following the functionality. So um, if you think you, you have a monolith for your eyes, take a, take a very good look on it and, and show what it is. Because even if you have an, maybe a big JBoss with Java server faces and things like that and Java portal or things like that, even then, it may be that inside of it, there is a very good vertical structure. So it is not, not only on the, on the technical side. Um, and um, yeah, on the other side, as I said, don't trust in using cool Microsoft frameworks to get the right architecture. So think vertical. Start from the requirements engineering part um, to to see what are your, your domain parts, what are the, the columns to, to divide the application in, and then very, very clearly divide them. And yeah, do, give, give the developers no chance to bring different functionalities together on an easy way. Then do the maximum to reduce um, dependencies between those parts, because um, so on, on every dependency you try, you would like to introduce, yeah, take the work and do it, do it another way. And it's, it's much work not to get dependencies. Maybe you, sometimes you have to do two or three days work only to avoid to get a new dependency in it. But this maybe will, maybe, um, yeah, you will get an outcome of it some month later, I think. One very, very essential thing is that on, on bigger applications and bigger teams, you have to, um, you have to build end-to-end -end teams, functional on the, the whole of the, the whole application. So if you um, divide the team and the development in different, in different horizontal um, teams, then the architecture will always follow this and you will not be able to make a vertical functional design on it because the, the communication and team will always tend or lead um, in this way to it that the dependencies, that the dependencies in software will follow the teaming and so you will get a horizontal architecture. So I've talked a bit about vertical, horizontal. What, what does it mean of this? In a classical approach, you have maybe this, this simple architecture. And so UI layer, you have services and you have persistence layer with it. And um, if application grows, and uh, this is also the, the difference between the, the older ZOA approach and the Microsoft approach. If the, the system grows, then you mostly get this pyramid um, thing, this pyramid architecture where you have a central UI layer, different services, and on the persistent services or logic services, it's more and more splitted. But um, with this, you are not able to reuse parts of it, and um, you will end up with, a, with one software system and, um, not, not, not dividable because um, you have the UI layer and you cannot control how functionality of one domain will use the functionality of another domain. My ideal, ideal view of a microservice architecture would look like this, that you have for every functionality a cleanly designed column where you split up on, on every vertical, on every horizontal um, layer. Uh, you split up for the microservice columns. So 
in the database layer, in the service layer, and especially in the UI layer, you may split up the application in single, in single part, part applications which are distributed, distributable, changeable, and um, um, developable separately. To make this a uh, little bit more practical, I have um, made, a, made an example for, for a webshop. So imagine you have a standard webshop like every one of us knows it. So with a with part of product catalog and um, a product list view, product detail view and things like that. This is a very good example um, to show how it is dividable in, in different columns. Now maybe I have to out of the view. Um, in an old way, one would make one application for all of them. Maybe um, two applications, one for the, for the end user and one for administration or things like that. And um, in a somewhat more modern and um, yeah, software developer who would like to get modularization in it may try to uh, extract the business logic area and uh, domain objects for all of those and try to split it with libraries or things like that to get it a bit more modularized. But um, I think the right approach is to um, divide every functional part in a, in a very own column with as few uh, uh, with as few dependencies to each other as possible. Um, so I will go go through it. So for login, for example, um, you should bring things like login um, in a in a single component, where you have the login service and a data store for login, for example. And the data store is not the same like the other um, areas have, but the data store is simply for logins or for registration and user permissions maybe, so that you can do the login part. Even it's thinkable, thinkable that the login is divided, that you can divide the login in more uh, columns. And then this, this um, application part should also serve the UI for the administration stuff and for the end user stuff. So with this first column, it's very easy um, on a development side. So you will end up with a small web application, which just enables you to see a login form, for example, to log in with it, and then get redirected to a next to another to another part. So um, the other parts don't have their login logic by themselves, don't provide it. But if you come to another side, then they will see, oh no, it's not login redirect to the first to the first service and um, don't handle them themselves from the browser view point of view um, it's essential not to to follow an yeah portal like approach where you have one vertical one horizontal layer um, in between which ties everything together so um, if you do it hardline this architecture, then the browser in the first case comes to this service on maybe in a completely different um, domain. So um, this may be login.shop.com, for example. And this um, are, on a, are different subdomains. Of course, it's possible I mean, in, a, in a second step to bring an Apache in front of it or things like that to, to mix it together um, again. Um, so let's say the user has logged in, then it comes maybe to, uh, maybe it's a administrator to management area um, with a product catalog. Even this part is vertical designed and um, independent of the, of, the, of the other parts. So um, it has, for example, the, the product, um, yeah, edit forms for, for product or import forms or things like that, import functionality to create all the products. And as you see, the microservice approach enables you to give every functional part, every column, its own database, its own approach in storing data. 
So in this part, maybe you decide to say, okay, product catalog, this is a relational uh, approach, so I use a Postgres database and you store it in the Postgres database. Then after adding products, the next you want to do is browse them, search them, do, do listings of them, and this is a, yeah, you can say it's the same, so I will do it in one component. But if you take a closer look on it, it's a completely different thing because um, the, the user side, so the, the end users are different ones. The scalability is a completely different, so maybe you have two or three people adding products, but I hope some million customers um, using it, so you have completely different scaling, um, scaling requirements. And the requirements for your database are also very different. So here you would like to have a transaction and absolutely safe uh, data handling and things like that. And everything you would like to have here is very fast results, very fast searching. And, um, but you don't need any normalization here, so it can be completely denormalized. Um, so maybe an elastic search, another document-oriented search index database would be perfectly fit here. So why mix it up in one application if you can divide it? You simply need an interface between those services to give the data to the next one and um, store it in, in this format. So the, the end user will completely use this column and this data store and does not have anything to do with your Postgres database. And this is um, read-only so you can re uh, yeah, um, re replicate and uh, replicate it and um, yeah, store it, ship it, um, even you have here maybe you have real-time dependencies because on safe you want it safe. Here you don't have real-time dependencies in most cases so maybe it is enough to push changes in product database to the, to the clients um, so, or to the, to the workers here every hour or things like that. So you can handle it in a very different way. And this column um, is much smaller, so you have a, a, a simple application. Much simpler if it has this complexity with it. And you can redeploy this part, for example, as you like, bring down the server, redeploy it, have one hour downtime for the product catalog if your product managers don't care, without changing the uptime of this column. So if uh, in the dividing brings you a lot. Okay, next part, let's see the product details. So you have a, your list, you click on a product, then you will see the detail. For example, in this, um, in this image, I say, okay, the product detail, um, talks with this over an interface and gets the product data from there, so all products are here and this column doesn't have, an, have its own database. You always also could have this decided otherwise. And um, yeah, you, you've divided, especially in the UI, so you, maybe your, your, your searches are more frequently used than your um, product details or you, you have your product detail service also in other functional contexts, then you can handle both very independent of each other. Okay, come to the next part. So a shopping cart is a very interesting example because it's, it's also very, yeah, very splittable from the rest because um, it has its own UI mostly. So if you are on the shopping cart detail view, it's, it's um, different from the other views, and um, it has very different storage requirements again. So maybe you have the shopping cart in a session based, you can s store it on server in memcached or something like that. Of course, other possibilities would also be there. And you can handle it independent of this part. So this is read only, and, um, staying read only disk data, and this is a uh, session-based um, storage. Here on the UI is a very interesting case to bring them both together because I said every column should serve their own UI too. So not one UI, but of course, when I search um, products and I'm in details, I always want to see uh, that I have 42 items in my shopping cart. 
So um, I need to, yeah, I should make a line here. So I need uh, another way to interact in the UI. There are different solutions for that. It so also would be possible to say, oh no, I'm not that hardliner, so in this UIs, I do call to the service and bring, uh, bring it in there. Or it's possible to surf even the icon and maybe an overlay menu or things like that from this column as a UI fragment, so a small HTML part or things like that, and let this UI catch it from the other column to, to bring it in. So these are very similar examples. When I finish my shopping cart, I can um, redirect to a checkout area with, with own dialogues, which is independent of each other. It's, it just needs this data, the, the end state of this data as an input and has uh, an output which um, has to be stored in any transactional safe database, for example. So an order management at the end, for example. So this should give you uh, an, an, an idea what, what I mean when I say, okay, uh, introduce a very, very hard um, functional followed um, separation. So this is from the architectural part, the next but it's more, more technical. Um, even uh, when I said that there is no real definition on microservices, there is a very good talk from James Lewis, um, which you can see online. Um, there he, he was talking about microservices and the most papers or uh, talks are referencing him because he yes, said something, some, some very simple things um, but they are very, very essential, I think. So I did not try to bring, a, bring an own definition here. So a microservice has to be small with a single responsibility. So make it very small that it only does one thing at one time. Um, what's small? Small is it when it is small enough to fit in your head at a time. So is it bigger to understand it in, in one moment than it's too big, then you have to split it up. Of course, it's, it's a somewhat soft definition, but it's the only definition um, possible, I think, on being small. And small enough that you are able to rewrite it instead of maintaining it um, for a very, very long time. So if you design such a column very small, then it may be e more easy to replace it with a new software component. And because it's small and you have very few dependencies to neighbor columns, um, because of this, it is easy to, uh, to know the specifications of it and really do a replacement on it. It's hard to, it's easy to uh, get an idea of a separation, but it's hard to enforce that this separation um, will, will live uh, for a long time. Um, so if you see Conway's law and things like that, then you see that the, yeah, the water always follows the, the easiest way. It always is, uh, yeah, it always is going from, from hills to ground. Um, so you have to uh, do some things to enforce it, that to make it hard to bring in new dependencies. One of this um, is, is that you have to make every service an own software component. So it has to be in its own um, version control system with its own build system, buildable, uh, totally in, uh, independent of each other. And if you have dependency or come code with other components, then you should treat other components as external projects, not as, um, oh, this is, this is my project one, this is my project two, I can make a uh, my comments library and put all shit in this. Then you, yeah, then you um, are already um, building a monolith. So the only code I think which, or he thinks, and I agree, um, which can be common code and common libraries is um, infrastructure code. So maybe networking code, 
maybe authorization code, things like that. So um, no functional code. There's always um, or often a question how to treat domain objects. So when I see the domain-driven design um, ideas and things like that, then it's all, it's often I've often seen that people are um, yeah, making a very very big object model and class model of all of their objects and relations with them together. So isn't there worth in reusing this in all of your columns? I say no because um, every column would have its own view on the data. So there is not, not the true object model for all of your system. So let's see, for example, um, an, an order item record, so a product. The, the data type of the product for the list and the detail view is very different from the data I know I have to have in the um, order service at the end, for example. So there is no worth in having one Java class representing this and this. Because in one case I need very much data and images and things like that. In the other case, only the number maybe and the price. So, how to implement it? Um, I'm, I have a Java background, so or mostly Java background. So a lot of things may, especially, uh, are true for Java, but um, in other languages also. But as you see, the Java world, um, they were were very bad with, with this idea for a long time. So building monoliths, monoliths with Java is the easiest thing, I think. And other languages are doing it uh, a bit better since, since a lot of time. But you also in PHP, for example, when I deploy all my PHP code together in one Apache, then it's also uh, the same thing like is if I had all the Java code in one JBoss. So the key idea to, to think different, uh, someone laughing, he was in a project with me <laughs> and knows this. Um, the, the key thing in implementation is forget all about application servers. So when we saw Java, we had application servers with the idea to deploy everything in this container, but um, we mostly saw that the, that the um, container configuration was done very specialized, so we end up in multiple container deployments um, for for every application. One of this, so yeah, see this as a, as the truth and try to bring um, the the complexity of the container to minimize the complexity of the container and bring it uh, ship it together with the application. So the application the container is part of the application. It's the same like. Um, and uh, Unix daemons do for, for a long time. So bring up one daemon and don't care from the outside view and deployment view um, about the implementation language. Um, choose the right stack. As I said, um, you have the freedom for every column to choose what's, what's, um, your, what the requirements are saying you. Um, you can not only use this for the database choice, but for the for all of the applications. So if you need a very reactive system, yeah, with much asynchronous, maybe it's a different um, technology choice than than um, a simple web UI where or for things like that. So you can choose for everything a completely different stack. But of course, be careful because. Um, it would be hard to train every person to, to know every stack. Um, and it's very, there are two strategies I, I've read about um, how to decide when to bring up a new service. I'm a big um, favorite of, um, of, in the first step, try to bring every functionality in its own service. And if you say, if you see that the service is too small, in the next step, maybe merge it in another service because it's much more easy to uh, merge multiple services together to one instead of um, splitting a big monolith afterwards, which is absolutely impossible. So even if you uh, let your small service grow and think, okay, let, let it grow, then split it, let it grow, then refactor it, I don't think that, is, that, it, that this would be possible. 
On the other side, I can um, recommend three frameworks. Um, Spring Boot is a somewhat younger framework from the Spring community or from the Spring company um, to uh, start Spring applications um, themselves. So um, in, the, in Java, instead of an application, application server, you will always end up with a fat jar where you have all your dependencies in the jar and start the service by doing java minus jar. The jar and maybe configuration file as argument, so everything you have to do is ship one file, have one configuration file to bring the service up. My favorite framework, because I'm not so, um, so familiar with Spring, I think Spring is nice, but it's never be mine, <laughs> it never um, become mine. Um, my favorite is Drop Wizard, which is um, coming from Jama, and there's one very active developer who is um, pushing it, and it's, it's a very simple framework. So if you would start with a with your own Java main and add everything you need for doing REST, for doing configuration, and you will do it very smart, then it would be maybe equal to to that what Drop Wizard is. But you don't have to do it yourself. You can easily use drop wizard for it. Um, Martin Lai had a talk about drop wizard um, before me. So if you're interested in it, you also can um, show the recordings afterwards. Vertex is a very, oh no, it's not very new. It's there for, for some time now, but it's a very different approach to um, make, to, to think about software and, and as, as, asynchronous communication. And Vertex also has a possibility uh, to, to create fat jars out of your services and to start them standalone. In other uh, um, languages, there are also a lot of ways to simply write a daemon because it's not a, not a new thing to write one simple service. So I don't have, have brought them up here. I started, uh, or I already said something to, to database. What should I do? How to, should I implement a database? Um, the, the essential is that you should try to give every column its own database for semantical reasons, architectural reasons, and for um, scaling reasons. Um, especially, uh, my experience is that in the, in the question, should I use a NoSQL or not a NoSQL database here, or relational database here, and I always could not say, ah, this is better or this is better, I don't want to lose this one or the other. And um, with microservices, it's mostly very easy because for one service, it's mostly very clear to say which is the better approach. Mostly it's not a NoSQL approach, but you don't lose anything because in this, on this parts where you want to use a relational database, you can use it still. There are, you need some strategies because of sometimes one part, of course, needs data from another part. There are um, some ideas on it. Um, so first, have uh, the clear idea, but um, don't be a hardliner. So the easiest way is, to, of course, to and the cleanest way is, of course, to make a make a call, maybe REST call to a different service and get the data by there. But um, to optimize and to optimize this, don't fear about um, redundant data. So fetch your data, store it in your own database there for next time, or refetch it if you if you think think it's it's not um, guilty anymore. And um, don't fear the data redundancy. It's also uh, possible to yeah, to replicate it, to pull it by feeds, for example, and um, always yeah, bring the data you you need um, in your database. There are also some solutions you should not try to use, but which are um, yeah, short solutions, um, which may be may be good for you. Um, one simple thing is if you have a relational database, then use one database for different services, but give every service its own schema. Then um, you can make read-only views, for example, to access data from other schemas. Then it's 
not that clear, but it's also a good, good solution. Um, or like an Oracle or thing like that, you can also use database, te database techniques like database link or things like that to get the data of other data stores. On the UI, it's a very complicated part, and I think there are not not so much um, good known solutions um, until now. Um, the essential thing is make every service really independent of an, another one. So don't let one service serve the layout and the, the menus and things like that, and another service only the content, so not a portal idea, but make every service independent serving the, the full page. So if you directly navigate to this service, to this subdomain or things like that, then you get this, this um, then you get the full application. Um, to not have to, of course you don't want to do uh, styling and layouting 100% redundant, so maybe it's um, a good thing to have a central asset service which serves common com parts for all of them. Um, it's also a good, good thinkable to, yeah, um, to deliver the essential parts from every service themselves and let them um, be merged on the client side by asynchronous um, JavaScript, I think like that. If you have single page apps, it's, I think it fits good in this, in this idea. Um, but then, of course, you have to make a full, re full redirect, full page load um, on every service border to another one. So, um, in, in, in one service, it's not a problem to um, make a single page app. Um, yeah, one thing I, I mentioned with the shopping cart is the idea when one view is not 100% splittable to different services, you always have views where the user has to see data from different services. Then um, you have two solutions, call a REST service and fetch the data and uh, don't be a hardliner and simply show the data there. Or the, the other idea, um, maybe make a link to the other page and um, let some JavaScript fetch this link and uh, or follow this link and let the JavaScript fetch a GUI fragment on this and um, bring the GUI fragment in your DOM. Security is one of the uh, most hard and most important parts um, because now you have maybe if you have 100 microservices, then you have 100 contexts, with contexts, and all of them has to have a, a shared understanding about security. Um, the best idea is to to see security, log in, log out, user user management, self administration, and things like that. Um, see this, handle this as own services, own microservice columns, and um, then um, yeah, bring them together through an identity management thing system or things like that, or protocols like OAuth two, for example, which is um, very good for um, lock-in in distributed environments. So, oh, yeah, there's another slide on this. So if you have this, there are two two simple possibilities. The simplest one, if they are all the services are available under one domain or the same um, top level, second level domain, um, then then it's easy to um, let the login application create one cookie with, um, for example, username, timestamp, permissions, and things like that. Crypt this, co this cookie, um, sign this cookie, and let every service get this cookie and verify the signature. Then you have a completely decoupled the, the different services um, from from calling each other for security, and everyone is, is able to check the the login and signatures themselves. Um, but of course, you have to yeah have 
uh, have to have a commitment between all services to do the login in this way. The other variant, um, if maybe you don't have all of these um, parts in your, uh, in your control, then you should, for example, use OAuth 2 or a similar protocol um, where one makes a redirect to the login service that a redirect, that a login um, can be done, a redirect to the service again will, will come and the service can exchange a token so that it um, know that he, can, he now can trust um, the, the, the user. And on visiting, let the user visiting the second service, this double redirect can be transparent um, without that the user, without a reader a relog in from the user side, so these are two possibilities to make um, log in somewhat easy. Um, we have a, an open source product. We also have the boost have a boost there. Um, it's called Osiam, which um, gives you nice services for exactly this this log in um, use case. So we have a resource server there with a REST interface uh, from Skim2 standard um, for accessing the, the user data and group data. We have an authorization server um, supporting OAuth 2 for the login and we have um, self-administration parts and things like that and admin UI for the as, um, standalone services um, for the administration and self-administration of the data. So communication, some I already had said um, REST sometimes. REST is of course a favorite of, of many people because it's a very simple choice. It's very easy to implement. It's Im easy implemental between different languages and so it's the way to do it today. But um, in Microsoft world you can do communication as you like. So you may have different requirements. Uh, not to choosing, not leading to, to rest, for example, maybe. Um, principles are that you try to um, to decouple the, the services from each other, so one service should know as few as possible about the other service. But um, this this was something the the enterprise service buses has promised for a long time. Don't try to bring any logic or data handling or sec maybe not even security in the communication channel. So make it very very thumb so only data in data out. Simple simple things. But of course. Um, it may be a very good idea to, to bring something more intelligent in it. For example, uh, for asynchronous scenarios um, or uh, higher reliability and higher performance or things like that. Especially in uh, enterprises, um, you would have sometimes have very, very um, essential services which um, Essential to 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 save them to not get um, too much load from the from web web layer. Um, so there you need uh, an asynchronous mode where where the the service can fetch everything it wants to do, not not getting um, too much connections, for example. Because you have a distributed system where the action of one may um, need action of other, you have to take uh, have to be very care careful what um, error handling and failure handling is. So um, it's very essential that the 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 um, system is able to to redo its job even if failures were there and things like that. Um, one word about API versioning. I never saw. Uh, successful versioning of remote APIs in an internal, for internal usage. Of course, if you have external REST services or SOAP services, you have to version them. But um, in internal communication, um, you should don't use this, I think. So um, if you have both sides under control, then it's a lot easier to, to change things together and to, to make them upward and backward compatible where possible. Testing is a very interesting point on microservices. Um, 
the uh, some yeah, you can say that the or some people even say you don't need unit tests at all because your servers are getting so small and the thing you would cover by unit tests are so small that um, it's not worth to test it at all but um, yeah you should not not make a hard rule but see how to how to cover enough code and um, the integration tests for one service so the component tests or integration tests for one service are getting more and more worth on it and more and more worth because the yeah, the service itself is the the unit to test in most cases um, there's an idea of consumer driven tests which is hard to to get it working but it's very worthful if you if you get it managed where uh, every consumer in a distributed system defines its own tests and commits its tests in a test pool and the service who wants to release has to pass all the tests of all its consumers because it's um, yeah, because then you test what the the consumers really want to want to do with your API, and not what the service provider thinks he should do. Deployment is a big topic where we see all the magic um, current deployment um, technology brings us. So, um, of course, you have a because of, you have more deployments you need. 100% automated deployment tools like um, Puppet, things like that. Of everything should be packaged with standard standard Debian or RPM or things like that, and robust init scripts and things like that. Because you have to have a system which is very easy handleable. Some hardliners even are um, thinking currently that you should. Uh, solve the deployment of the application by replacing with the deployment of um, complete systems. So Docker is upcoming since a year now, and um, this is an, uh, an yeah you can it's some something like a change route in usage or like a virtual machine in usage, but it's very lightweight, so you can um, easily bring Docker images um, up in 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 a second, for example, and ship images to, to other locations. So um, Microsoft's hardliners currently are only making the Docker image, putting the service in it, and um, don't have a packaging or init scripts or things like that for the, the service at all. And But only ship the, the image then. Monitoring, of course, is a is a big issue because when you have a lot of services, then um, you have a distributed monitoring problem, and there are a lot of tools currently supporting this. There was a good talk on this yesterday. So um, take a look on Logstash, Graylog, Kibana, and things like that to get um, multiple services loggable together. Also, there's the idea of real-time metrics. There are some Java packages, for example, on it, for it to um, it's a service and REST interface where you can monitor it in real time where it's where it's up and not only write and lock and yeah see, see the result later. Okay, is my last slide and we have some time for, for comments and questions. Um, for me the, the microservice idea is, is the most essential and biggest idea um, currently upcoming, so I think it it will change a lot. But um, of course, it's not not without risks. So, um, like every new paradigm, you should be very careful. It should start with simple, small projects and then then bigger ones. But um, in my opinion, this is the this is the only way to um, handle the application complexity of big platforms which we have today. So on the risk side, we have the problem that the, we have to the inventory of a lot of services. So we have to know where the, do we, which services are where are which service running. The operation is very challenging. So if you have an, a standard operations team, then they will get new new uh, things to do and to know. If not done right, you may get um, call cascades and a lot of network traffic. If you're not not doing it right, but I think if you're doing it right, then 
the the calls are are not that much because the, if you have the functional splits done right, then um, you do, do not should need too much calls to other services. Um, the biggest thing maybe it's a, it's an absolutely new way of thinking for for many people, and it is not enough to start the thinking from the developer because if you have a specification 300 pages specification you have to build a system then you already have a monolithic specification and to split this up to have functional modules in it is not possible at all so you have to start on the application design functional design and start with this um, maybe have different um, product managers for different services and things like that and bring a whole, a whole organization in, in this mode. And the freedom of technology, technology selection may also be a big risk because if you don't have a, a good governance, um, then it's not only a chance to uh, always stay on new technology, but it's also a risk to um, having everyone making what, what, he, what he likes to do and you get in chaos, of course. So that's it. Thank you for listening. Yes, I think we have to do to use this. Does it work? Okay, this is maybe simpler. Yeah, please. Yeah, you have the, the standard problem, I think, of interdisciplinary. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, the question was, if you have um, multiple columns and you, and you have the UI and you, for example, want to get a desktop and mobile application out of it, how would you handle it from a teaming perspective um, to serve the mobile UI in every service themselves? So... Um, for me, it comes back to the problem of interdisciplinary agile teams, where you where you have it. So it's uh, it's not easy to get it to get it done, but um, you should try to put uh, all the experts for every um, for every UI in every team, and um, serve the the mobile interface from every service. So every service also should serve its own mobile interface. Of course, if you can achieve this, it's not a problem to, to bring your one mobile expert and let them implement it for everything, but then he will identify common parts, common code, and um, will make its own together glued GUI UI for all of this, I think. Yes, please? In some point, it is more risky if you um, have your monolith and don't get it really split it into vertical parts then you then you will um, then you will fail with this because um, if one call from the end user needs i think say five or ten services then the, the system will not you will not get the system really robust but um, if one call only needs one service or two services, so one web call, then you don't have more um, risk than, than with one service. Even um, it can be safer because an, a failure or downtime of one service may not um, tend that, that all the complete application does not run any longer. 
but um, you have to um, invest a lot in automatic deployment and monitoring and things like that. It's not so the deployment and monitoring part becomes uh, a lot harder than uh, monolith. Yeah. Yes, continue. At the first, you should um, ask you if you need consistency. Of course, we are from classic, from classic um, schooling, and we at, at one big thing. And when we're talking about data, we are talking about consistency. You should try to uh, to live without consistency. If you can handle that, then it's it's much more easier. And often, even if you have one monolithic database system, and you think, "Wow, I will make it consistent." Then even in those cases, years after getting live, you mostly get inconsistent inconsistency on some parts, and you have to make application logic dealing with inconsistency. So this is not not the answer you asked for, but it's, I think it's an important thing um, to to be aware of. Um, even make service robust against um, real consistent data. The other thing is, um, yeah, you have to to take the, the right solution for your environment. So one thing can be if you say, okay, I want this logical approach because I think it's good, but I want everything totally consistent. Yeah, um, get a, a big Oracle stack and uh, make different schemas, but let them work on one monolithic database um, in the bottom and make everything very hard in a database. Then you only have the logical point of view and the freedom to decide another database store maybe in the future, but um, have everything together. If you decide um, to, uh, to split it 100%, then you will lose consistency. A lot of um, the NoSQL database currently are very good in synchronizing data by, uh, to, to different nodes and uh, things like that by, by built-in features. Um, and an often done approach is to, to make something like an atom feed or things like that, that every service offers a simple HTTP-based feed where other services can pull with change stamps and things like that and replicate the data. But on this, you have to do a lot of work by hand. So this, there is no perfect way to do it. Um, you have to, to do it um, on your best opinion. Yeah. Behind it? Yeah. Well, I have two related questions. Uh, the first is uh, similar to the uh, one we can for the mobile clients or the desktop clients. Um, would it be simpler to uh, have the individual services to serve the more abstract implementation of what people should see, like XML or JQuery or something, and then have a front end server that renders it into uh, various file implementations? I don't think so, because um, my experience, but it's only about uh, meanings. Um, my experience is that um, if you have that and then you have a functional change, then you have to go to every layer and change and do the changes on these layers. And so you have to, yeah, you, you changes, functional changes are distributed to a lot of different deployment modules. So you have another problem. I think if you say I can han can't handle the mobile client served by every, because not the web client maybe, by every uh, functional unit, then the res representation I would suggest is um, simply um, using the REST APIs and, yes, using a completely different UI and consume the REST APIs. It's also a good thing. Oh, I could talk one hour with you about that. And there are some people I know uh, which could attend it. One more. So there, it's it's very hard, and um, from performance deployments things, and you don't need it in most cases. So you, in most cases, but it's yeah. Okay, I got the point that this was the last question. If you like to uh, do discussion, I invite you to to come with me, and we can talk about it longer. Thank you.